for that for the introduction and, and thank you all very much for giving me an opportunity to come along here this afternoon to share with you some of our experiences up in, uh, in, in County Laos. Um, what I thought I would do is, um, we're, we're on a journey um, and it started about four years ago um, and I thought maybe I'd give you a, a couple of, of pictures of some of the questions that we were asking ourselves four years ago and, and, then, and then maybe just a little bit about the journey that we've been on, on since then. Um, our, our very early considerations were, were what, 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 what is this challenge around um, aware homes or intelligent environments or technology and, and how does it all work? So we kind of pulled together a very kind of abstract picture here of, of this kind of you know, an intelligent environment with, with people living in it and maybe a carer in it and a caring community made up of, 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 of either nurses or GPs or, or, or family and friends and others. And these little dots were, were sort of you know, visualizations of kind of sensors or actuators. So there was this sense of, of data being gathered either from the residents themselves or from the environment coming into some kind of modeling or control environment some decisions being made and spread across across the community and feedback being brought back either to actuators, something that's going to change something in the environment or, uh, or inform the resident or inform a carer and, and, and get that world going. Um, and, and the questions that we were asking really back in the very early days is what's, what, what is all this? What's the nature of these conversations and the messages? Is it conversations or is it encoded things wrapped up in HL7 and, and, and you know, medical things? Um, how does control and participation and decision making manifest itself in this kind of world? Um, what's its motivation? Is it around trying to really create a more holistic, independent living environment for the resident? Or is it actually more around making services easier to provide? Is it, you know, what, what are we actually trying to achieve here? Is technology going to be more liberating in all of this and, 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 and the big challenge of Big Brother and, 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 and the sensing there? More about technology. Is it just about technology or is the whole ecology and the environment that this is operating in, the space, the form, the light, the heat, all of those other things that are, that, that are sitting around the side of it um, important and, and the social care model. And we've got this little sort of um, uh, running away resident who's left the control environment. How does this work when you leave an environment and go downtown and go to the supermarket and all the rest of it? And, um, you know, does context awareness allow that kind of liberation? The second piece that we were looking at was that was inside that, that, that infrastructure, what, what are we talking about in terms of awareness? Um, you know, we're, we're sensing, we can sense the environment, we can sense activities of daily living, we can sense things around sort of social interaction, and there are more and more devices for doing kind of medical and, and, and health sensing. So it was this kind of sensing, this idea of pattern recognition or trying to understand what, that, what, what we're gathering from that through looking at patterns and then analysing the patterns and determining needs and then coming back with some kind of response or intervention model. Um, and how did we respond? So um, we, we sort of indirectly had sort of um, uh, ambient directly and indirectly. So what we meant there was is that a communication might go directly back to the, to, to the resident um, in terms of a direct communication. It might be indirectly to a carer or a family member, or it might be ambiently in terms of changing something about the environment, whether it's lighting levels or sound or acoustic or heat or something, some, 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 some ambient characteristic. And that we had a kind of a learning feedback coming back and, 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 and informing all of this. Really to try and move away from a model that was reactive to alarms and events and into a more aware model where we would have a better sense of early detection, early diagnosis and early interventions um, and being able to kind of better orchestrate delivery. Um, and, and I suppose that the things that we were looking at um, were, were around, you know, older people with sort of frailty and, 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 and muscular challenges, um, sensory decline, um, chronic diseases and then cognitive <coughs> impairment. So we weren't looking at this specifically as a, as a, as a dementia project, we were looking at the, the range of ageing related issues. Um, they're the challenges that we saw four years ago, we're four years on, the world, we've been going quite a way to try to build an infrastructure to help us start to answer some of these questions and that's really the, the, the journey that I'd like to, I'd like, I'd like to go through. Um, but. Um, but our world changed quite quickly in the sense that there was that there was the, the, the we've been doing this project in Dun, in Dundalk and um, as we got started we got involved with the the age friendly counties by the world the World Health Organization's age friendly cities program and that's changed the kind of framework that we've been working in and I wanted to explain a little bit about that because projects don't happen in isolation they happen in a context and that's something I'd like to go through so I talk a little bit about our sustainability and inclusivity context what Laos is as an age friendly county it's the first county in the country that's committed to the WHO's age-friendly program. There are several 
counties coming in behind it now as part of a, a national program. Uh, I know Kilkenny and Kildare and County Clare are all starting to come on board. Um, some of the specific issues are in ICT and ambient assisted living technologies, um, and then some of, maybe some of the transformational challenges that, 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 that we're dealing with. Um, so, I mean, our starting point, I mean, you've heard it, you know, the challenges of the demographics, I think, are well understood. Our need for alternatives to institutional care being well understood. Um, really looking to, 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 to look at this whole issue around ageing in place. And I suppose our challenge being around the confidence that older people would have to be able to stay and live at home. And, and really, what are we doing to reinforce confidence? And we saw that very early on as being three things. The quality of the home environment the nature of the enveloping services that are available to sub to people in, in, in and around their neighbourhood, and, and then the opportunity for inclusive technologies to, A, help the person in the home, um, but also connect them to services as well. So, so um, we, we, we saw our intervention as being three things, the environment, the technology, and the care model. And really, the more we've gone into the project, the more we realise that actually you can't you can't not but look at it as, 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 as three elements. Um, but once we start, once we went down this journey, um, we realised, and, and certainly the, 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 um, uh, the World Health Organisation and the county programme developed, was that um, demographics isn't the only thing that's happening out there at the moment. There is a big shift in demographics, and, and that's something that we have to respond to. But um, at a global level and at national and regional levels, um, urbanisation is an intermediate. You know, so you know, people are moving in from rural areas into, um, into, into living in our cities. So our whole, what, what's our housing strategy? What's our settlement strategy? going forward in relation to that. Um, Globalisation and jobs, not so maybe much of an issue here, but, but climate change also becoming a very, very big element um, in terms of, in terms of um, how we're looking at our neighbourhoods and how we're looking at things like transport and, and, and that. So there are, there are these trends, um, really, I suppose, settlement economy, um, climate and demographic change all happening together. And how we respond to them is actually really the kind of the future that we're going to create. In Ireland, nationally, that comes into our spatial strategy, our, our, our economic competitiveness strategy, our greening framework, and our positive ageing strategy with our new Minister for Older People trying to bring forward a, um, a positive ageing framework and, and, and ageing well. But at a, at a county level, that manifests itself in actually how do we plan our services and how do we plan our housing going forward, um, and, 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 and how do we look at, at, at participation. It's an enormous challenge for it looked an enormous challenge three or four years ago, but it's you know we, we are no longer the Celtic tiger. Um, I, I heard it recently referred to as a Hibernian hyena, um, which is probably more, more appropriate in terms of, of, how, of how things are tightened. But um, but we, but we, we we have to be able to do more with less in a, in a world where we're not as certain about the kind of things that we have to deal with, and and maybe not all of our responses are going in the same direction. Um, just a quick picture of Laos. Um, what we've got here is the population at, at sort of the, the young old, the middle old, and the older old by population and by density. Essentially, Laos has got two major urban areas in Dundalk and Drogheda. Um, but what you're seeing is, is that we actually have, in terms of um, relative distribution, a lot of our older people are living rurally. And, and, and our challenge is both to re respond in our urban centres, but also to pick up some of the, some, some, some of the rural challenges that we've got. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Age Friendly Cities program, um, the WHO um, launched a program several years ago called the, the, the Age Friendly Cities program. 33 cities from 22 countries participated in it and Dundalk represented, um, re represented Ireland in it. And it was a massive consultative exercise um, around these eight key themes to try and understand what are the barriers and the directions that older people themselves are saying would help to make their cities and communities more age-friendly going forward. So it was a very holistic agenda around building and outdoor spaces, I suppose the urban design agenda, housing, um, uh, which is you know, you know, a key element here, um, transport and transport and getting round and about. Um, then the, the softer ones around respect and inclusion, um, uh, social participation, civic participation and employment, um, information and communication and whole access to information to empower older people and then the issues of community and health services. Um, so um, a, a very, very broad set of domains and actions being driven on the back of all of that. Um, in Laos, our goal was to um, bring forward a plan that was going to increase participation of older people in their plans, in, the, in, in, in developing the county, um, improve their health and well-being, and then look to see how our services and environments might become more responsive and what processes that we were going to have to do to, 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 to change it. Um, and then just very briefly, some of the 
I suppose the key things that were coming out to make our, our, our places more age friendly and, and that were issues around safety and security, around cross generational community vitality and sustainability. So, so more, more about cross generations, service access to better information, um, environments that recognise frailty. Um, uh, physical environments that help to reinforce community and, and more, 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 more sustainable neighbourhoods. The whole challenge of transportation and being able to get out and about and link and, 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 and connect. Um, living at home with confidence and connectivity and the supports that are necessary there. A rethinking of older people generally around um, shifting from this concept of, of ageing as a burden to older people as a bounty and the resources of older people as a really valuable contribution to the community and, and, and changing that around. And then this overall issue around quality. Um, we have loads of guidelines and loads of standards around how we should do this and technical guidelines around the minimum of this and the minimum of that and how much of that goes with how much of something else. And we miss thinking about the quality of actually how we come back and respond to these things. So a huge challenge around getting these things right in terms of quality. In, um, it's a, it's a bit, I suppose, the last of our organisational ones, um, the, the, the delivering of all of the work that we're doing in Louth um, has been embedded in the county development programme. So for those of you are the county development boards, so for those of you not in Dublin, um, we have um, a, an organisational structure called the county development boards who are responsible for bringing forward um, uh, development plans at the county level. But it's the only place where all of our stakeholders sit around the table and look each other in the eye and, and come up with integrated shared plans. So the HSE, the Garda, our Chambers of Commerce, our local authorities, our NGOs and our enterprise development agencies all sit at the County Development Board. Up until now, the County Development Board, it's not an executive function, it's only responsible for bringing forward plans, but we've been using the County Development Board as the collaborative engagement model in order to be able to bring forward all of the work that we're doing in County Loud. So um, the, our strategy is embedded within the cultural pillar within the County Development Board and the key piece that we had to bring together was a Loud Older People's Forum. Um, our, the voice of older people in County Loud would be very fragmented um, in lots of small older people's groups and um, very, very hard to channel the voice of older people to help shape strategy and shape development and shape things going forward. So a lot of work has gone into developing an older people's forum. It's supported by a services one and a, and a, and a business one, but um, we have, um, Mary Deary at our local authority has spent an awful lot of time and effort reaching into the community to try and get as, a, as inclusive a group of older people as possible to help not just advise, but to help drive and deliver the plan. Starting to look at some of the ICT levels, I mean, this was the petal that the World Health Organization would have had, but we've got lots and lots of ICT initiatives running up in County Loud that are delivering on some of these, 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 these projects and, and, and these, these strands. Um, I'm not going to dwell on very, very many. I'm going to pick out two that are, I think, of particular interest this afternoon. One is the Great Northern Haven project, and the other one would be a telehealth trial with Bosch. Um, they're affecting, because they're, they're really strengthening our, our kind of ageing in place um, opportunities. But um, clearly technology has a huge role to play in, you know, right, right across the spectrum trying to make places more age friendly. Um, what we've ended up with in County Loud, I suppose, is a three-tiered um, um, environment. Um, within Dundalk Institute of Technology and the Casala, uh, we, have, we have a Casala Centre which is supported by Enterprise Ireland, which is very much around um, simulation, technical laboratories, and workshops uh, that are that are working with companies um, in the in the, in in this in the field of, of, of ambient assisted living and, and technologies in the home. Um, but and part of it is actually a simulator that we can actually simulate environments at a very rich level and get experiences from. The piece I'm going to talk a little bit more about is our Great Northern Haven, which is a housing scheme that has been brought by the local authority and the, the, um, the, the HSE and the Institute of Technology. It just came on stream this year um, and it's really a learning platform for us to be able to start to understand how some of these technologies might fit together. And then at a broader level with our county infrastructure we have the opportunity to bring projects in that actually fit into people's existing homes and start to do some learning at that, at, at that level. So um, Casala kind of drives some of this kind of person-centred design and my network centre in, in DPIT is looking at more of the evaluation and analysis side of things. The Great Northern Haven project, it, 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 it's now, it, it was set up in Barrack Street. It's a, a 16 two-bedroom apartments um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in an urban location in Dundalk. Um, it was very much it's it's a collaborative venture um, with our with our 
County Council at HSE and DKIT supported with also University, DCU and, and SEI. Very much around this fusing of technology, environment and care. Um, our goal is to um, use it as a learning instrument to start to drive evidence. So it's not that we have all the answers and we've built our Goldstream house and we think that this is the answer. This is It's a work in progress project around being able to work with all the people who are living in this house, that is these housing, to start to understand how we might be able to develop and improve some of these platforms. Um, and so, so really around um, developing an evidence base for growth and intensification. And when I say intensification, um, we, we reckon, and we certainly recognise at the moment, the the ranges of dependencies that we may or may not be able to support at the moment. And we would hope to see over time the project being able to evolve through adaptation, through technology, in, in, technology intensity and care intensity, being able to support higher levels of dependencies. And I think that would be very more relevant to, 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 to people as they take on <coughs> dementias and become more, 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 more dependent. Um, certainly using it to try and, 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 and inform policy, um, but also that the project is there to try and stimulate innovation. Um, we would argue that actually this you know, the technologies that we're talking about in terms of telecare and telehealth have been relatively stagnant for 10 years uh, in, terms of what, in terms of what we're looking at. There's been a huge dearth of innovation in the technology um, and the barriers have been the processes and the models and the management models. We would like to kind of break through that and start to look at what are some of the challenges and opportunities of really designing some of this technology that people would want and like rather than need. Um, because in many instances, um, nobody wants to buy this stuff. You take it because a relative or a friend or a, an OT or somebody tells you you need it and it might liberate it. But in many instances, it's stigmatic and it's, 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 it's nowhere near it needs to be. Um, I don't. I, I, can't, I mean, I, I don't go into boots to buy one, and I'd like a pink one or a blue one or a green one or an orange one, and I'd like one with this font. And you know, you know, this needs to be mass market stuff, and we need to get industry to start to make some of these things. Um, the, just to, for those of you who don't know Dundalk, the, the site is about a, a, a kilometre from our from our town centre on the. So it is a, it is an urban site. As we zoom in, it's it's um, within the neighbourhood, about uh, within 150 metres. Um, we've actually got two pubs, which is great: um, um, a pharmacy, supermarket, a post office, a church, primary care. It, it's a, it's a, it's a living neighbourhood, but it's a, it's an old neighbourhood in Dundalk. Um, but it's very close to. I mean, we're very lucky that we had the primary care building to come up beside it, and our and our local authority dwellings. Um, it was part of the old Great Northern Railway Engineering Centre. Um, the scheme um, is, is um, as I say, 16 two-bedroom apartments, and we'll go in and have a look at the technology in a moment. So it's, it's um, built over two and three floors, um, an outreach centre and, and in-reach centre to, 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 to hook up with the community. Uh, one of the units has been set aside as a transition a step up respite um, and also demonstration training and learning. So people can come out of the hospital and, and go in here and maybe even live in here for a week or two, get the feel of how some of these technologies and adaptations might work and that can actually become the spec for going back to their own home in terms of ad adapting their own home. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's very kind of transition based. Um, our primary care building, um, and uh, so some of the key elements, um, space features around lifetime adaptability, um, clearly around accessibility and, and quality of the environment in terms of light and, and, and ventilation and healthy home. Um, Dundalk has a very strong commitment to sustainable energy, so the energy features, uh, uh, clearly that becomes a bigger issue going forward when we think about the challenges of energy poverty and that, um, and, and, our, and our, our new world of, of, of building ratings, but um, really, really utilising things like passive orientation and, and high insulation in the fabric and um, uh, a window and energy, energy sources and that to try and have a very, it's, it's an A2 rated building, so um, it's, we're going into our first winter now, so it's going to be really interesting for us to get a sense of how it, how it does respond and, 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 and change. And the, our, our world was very, it's very much designed around the idea that um, we want to adapt and respond to people's changing needs. So it's not, and it's not designed for dementia, it's not designed for chronic disease, it's not designed for disability, it's designed for older people. And if any of these um, um, uh, diseases or declines um, uh, manifest themselves, we want to see how we can adapt and respond um, and, and, and that. So, so it's, 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 a, it's a long life project. Um, just a couple of, of, of shots of the project. Um, so each of the apartments, um, so six on the ground floor, six on the second floor, and four on the on, on the upper floor. 
um, just the, 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 the kitchen dining area, um, uh, adjustable kitchen sinks, adjustable cooking, uh, lots of the, 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 the I suppose, um, assistive technologies, um, but, you know, the, I mean, the windows are, are remote controllable for opening and closing and curtains and light. So we come, we come and have a look at some of that in a moment. Um, I will just highlight this one device. You'll see it popping up occasionally, which is a small touchscreen device for, for people to be able to interact with a lot of the, a, a lot, a lot of the services. Um, what's particularly different about somebody living and being, being here is, um, We've introduced a new role in the community called a, 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 a in, in Gaelic, it's a kultaka, um, which I think is Gaelic for full back or strong support. Um, the, it, it's based on a model that we saw in Holland uh, where the terminology was called umthinker. And it's a sort of a cross between a, an advocate, a case manager and a professional friend. So we have two of them in the community working with us. One has a nursing background, one's an ex-garda. And they're... Their function is to help the older person to help themselves, and they are separate and independent from the service providers. So they're there with the older person to help beat up the service providers um, if they're not delivering and if they're not if they're not if they're not working right. So it's it's I know in disability there are the advocates and that sort of thing. So it's 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 a, it's a role that's there really to help connect the older person. At the moment, obviously, we've got the sustainability challenge of where does that sit. At the moment, they're employed by DKIT in the college. We have to go and develop the the the, the sustainability model around that, but but that's that's a very you know, unique role, and um, they're not only supposed to be supporting people in here; they're supporting the whole neighbourhood, and, and we're actually trying to grow that structure out right throughout the county at the moment. Um, adjacency to primary care services and access to primary care packages, which would be the the, the, the key element here. Um, but then the remote telehealth monitoring, and um, the home itself is is essentially. Um, brought, brought together by a local authority so um, with HSC support so um, one could see it in terms of social housing so it, 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 the, the technical management of the home is done by Clue, a voluntary housing body so in, ter in terms of getting the mix of, 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 of who's involved um, trying to get we're sort of moving into some of the more, the more, the more techie stuff, um, if we go back to that very first picture that we had our second picture about what our model was it's very much around looking at our house and seeing what can we sense. And we're sensing lots of different things. We can sense data entry, we can sense what people are putting into computers and what they're using on, on touch screens and what they're using on, on, on TVs. Um, we can sense, and as I said, we, we can, we're not doing all of this today. This, the, the, our, our infrastructure has been set up to be able to support us. Um, uh, you know, and, and that would also include direct interaction with 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 with, with, with health monitoring equipment. Um, you, we can we can measure some things off body with technology and clothing, technologies and shoes, technologies on watches. Um, clearly, there's a whole range of 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 um, technologies that that are around the environment in terms of room controls, um, even being able to put in sensors into furniture and doors and that, so that, so that, so, that, so that we can understand those kinds of things. And then you know objects that are used, um, remote controls, you know, your phones, all of those kinds of things. So there's there's an enormous amount of devices that are out there today that we can sense from. Our challenge is that almost every one of those are standalone. <laughs> And almost none of them are talking to each other or talking to anything else that allows us to be able to build a picture of what's actually going on. So a big element of it is actually being able to bring all of these onto a, a, a common platform where we can start to look at parsing the data and cutting it and dicing it and, and starting to do context ex estimation so that we have a better sense of what some of the behavior patterns are going on inside the home and um, that allows us to push through more I suppose more intelligent information whether it's evaluative reports or um, or particular actions or physiological data or behavior patterns which can then come into the, the piece of work that, that Enterprise Ireland are supporting us to work, which is this kind of context-aware broker. And really, that's, that's, that's a real kind of pattern recognition engine that will allow us to be able to start to think about what kinds of interventions we, we might want to take. So obviously, in many instances, you know, an intervention is simply a call to a carer or a call to a family fr friend or a family member. But over time, we want to start to explore 
lots and lots of different ones, whether or not it's very subtle environmental changes. I think somebody mentioned earlier using a light to help somebody navigate their way from a bed to a bathroom. That could be very context-based, and that light could just come on in certain times and certain, you know, under certain conditions. Um, if there's high stresses, high stresses in the in the room, changing mood, changing lighting, bringing on different. There's hundreds of things that we can start to do. We have no idea if they're right or if they're wrong, but really we see this as an environment for us to be able to test and we would be thrilled any of the researchers here that would like to come and bring projects in to be able to, to, to work with us on those. So um, we're, we're very keen to understand how, what are the best, or what are the, the kinds of interventions that might be most appropriate to come back in and either um, de-stress situations or, or de-risk situations um, and, 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 and then start to be able to, to, to improve quality of life. Um, just uh, the, 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 the device that we had here, just um, that, that's it again. We're, we're, we're trialling out multiple devices, so we're, we're, we're very technology agnostic, um, so it's very much around wanting to see which ones work. This is one that has a nice touch and feel, but actually doesn't respond very well to your fingerprint, so we're trying to look at some other ones that, 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 that come back in different ways. But, but you can see the challenge around trying to get you know, designs to be able to access here, so um, this is obviously telling temperature, but th these lights that are coming on telling us if windows are open or cookers are on and that sort of stuff. Um, that device and the television are the two key communication devices that we're dealing with. It's, a, it's, a, it's an internet-based TV, so a lot of the programming of these kind of widgets can be embedded in the TV as well and access through and, and access through remote control. Um, and also we'll come back a little bit more around maybe accessing um, health records and things. Over time, we see these kinds of platforms supporting a whole ecosystem of applications and services. Um, you've got to remember that we're looking at older people from a whole array of capabilities, some who will be quite active and in and out of the community, right through to ranges of things. So um, the kinds of things are obviously information around health, um, information around controlling their home, um, access to coupons, you know, local shopping, um, all of those kinds of you know, co community-based services, um, our broker itself, um, information on their sense of safety and security and those kinds of things and the alarms, um, how, the, how they're dealing with power usage and energy and heating and those kinds of things. All of these kinds of services need um, some interface devices to be able to, to deal with them. And um, we certainly don't envisage development is a whole plethora of kind of applications here. Um, our role is really to work with, with SMEs and other companies and other researchers to help try and bring some of these, um, the, 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 these services into play. Um, what I'm going to do, I, I, I think this, this should work, I think, yeah, we'll we, 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 we give it a go, um, is um, this is a small um, uh, clip of uh, the plan of the house. I'm just going to, going to go through it. Um, Brian is over here in one of the rooms. He's actually sitting in this room here looking at a little camera here and when it gets activated he's going to go around some things but but essentially what we've got here are um, little menus that are showing us different sensors and different actuators so um, what you've got here are we have we have sensors in the house and these are their 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 data map back here so there's sensors on doors and on, on windows here and windows and doors here door here door here the red ones being open the gray ones being closed um, at the moment, there's no sense of presence in any of these ones here, and we've got two lights on, and they're being reflected over here. Um, what's going to happen is, is um, uh, Brian's going to go and do a little tour, and as he tours, he'll trigger a, a constellation of these sensors turning on and off, um, just to give you a sense of the kind of data that we can gather. Um, and uh, some of them will be a little more latent than others. Some of them, some of them so we, we might actually do it twice. Let me just, just see if I do... Oops, sorry, no. Uh, go back here, do I? Sure. Just do it, just hit go, do it. Sorry, I was just... <laughs> oh, it's just click, is it? Hi, I'm just going to briefly show you some of the sensors in action in the smart home. I'm going to walk from this room, He's gonna open go the here. door, He's gonna go there. walk into the living room, and you can see sensors yeah. activating on the big screen all the time. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. So the present sensor of the hall has just gone on. He's coming in here. He's turned the light on and been picked up in this room. He's going back in here. He's going to open and close the door. And then he's going to come back in here. Turn on the light. Okay. 
Now, there's a couple of other things that have been going on in there. I, I, I might just find it because one of the things you might look here, there's a lux measure here. Um, there, there isn't a present sensor in this room, which is why that one hasn't gone green. But if I just do this again, I'm just going to run it again, just see what... Hi, I'm just going to briefly show you some of the sensors in action in the smart home. I'm going to walk from this room, open the door, walk into the living room, and you should see sensors activating on the big screen all the time. Okay, thank you. And if you just watch, watch this number. It's quite low at the moment. It's it's part, I think it's up at around what's that, 144 or something, and you started to drop. That's a, that was a, a light sensor, a lux sensor, and actually what it was picking up was all the, the daylight that was coming through here whilst those doors were open, and as those doors shut down, the light level dropped, and the, and the, that that measure has has dropped down as well. Um, we've got about. 2,400 sensors in this housing scheme um, of this type. Um, uh, so we're looking at, and so the 16 occupants in it um, are. Well, you can imagine the kind of data that's being generated from this kind of from this this kind of thing. Just just a very very brief picture around the challenge of um, this is a pattern recognition. It's around data gathering and um, visualizing the data, um, examining patterns, and then starting to look at, at algorithms that can start to auto auto attach. What we've got here is one sensor. This is data from just one sensor. It's the sensor in the hall that was turning on. And it's a clock sensor. So that's midnight, and that's a 24-hour clock going around that way. And each cone, or each slice of it, is a different day. And so this is, this is a clock sensor, or this is a clock display, or a visualization over, over a two-week period. Um, so, I mean, obviously what you can start to see is patterns of kind of peaks and troughs, um, you know, generally going to bed at night and getting up in the morning, um, ranges of activity. You can see some, some things. So we start to see patterns in the data, and then that starts to drive down further questions and further analysis um, until we can start to be able to actually start to pull some data, so some, 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 some more, more, more robust behavior. I mean, we know that these little trips during the night um, are all to um, they're all to the kitchen because the bathroom is right adjacent to the bedroom. They wouldn't have to go to the bathroom to 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 um to, to, to trigger these. So you can start by 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 starting to look at patterns and that get a very very rich behavioral analysis of what the what the rhythms and really this is about trying to get to understand what are the the, the natural rhythms of people in the, in in the home so that they can um, um, uh, so that when we start to see deviate major deviations we can start to to, to, to look at uh, look at, at, at early interventions um, just um, I'm not going to dwell too much on this one but but the, the technical architecture of this is is really in three layers um, it's 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 we're, we're sorry beg your pardon um, it, it's trying to look at, a, at an abstraction there that will allow us to draw data in from the sensors. Um, at the bottom level here, um, service interfaces that can plug back into to lots and lots of different services, and then how we deal with the data um, at the different levels of, of um, when it's raw, when it's processed, when we understand behavior. And over time, we will be building and developing much richer algorithms to start to process that data um, so that we can get, be we can get, we can get better, better analyses. Um, Really, I think where we want to get to is, is self-adaptive environments. So um, it's, we want to really get a better, better handle on how do we intervene? What are the right kinds of responses that are tuned to the specific needs and characteristics of individuals and their care context? So um, it's to try and get it as personalized as possible. But um, these are the kinds of things that we need to be looking at. Um, adaptive support um, across these ranges of challenges, falls, depression, sleep, and, and cognitive decline. Um, the timely involvement of carers and family. Better prediction in terms of the trend analysis and unobtru unobtrusive sensing. You probably got a sense that there was no obtrusive involvement in terms of being able to pick up that model. That was simply sensors that you would have in your home today, PIR sensors and, and contact sensors. Um, but then moving into learning and, and, and developing this on open platforms so that people can start to um, um, uh, start to develop and fill out the context. And I suppose for us the big challenges, and this is probably much more so for, 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 for dealing with dementia, is understanding the continua when we move from 
how people are controlling these environments with setting them up themselves and using remotes and that to when it becomes much more automated on the basis that somebody mightn't have the capacity to control and what does that mean and, and, and where do we draw the line? There's certainly questions that we would have. So this shift between being aware and the home being aware and, and just what happens naturally in terms of, of, of an ambient environment. I mean, we take it for granted now that thermostats will turn on and manage our heat and manage our things. What one's looking at here is, are other things going to start to happen? Um, and and are, we going to, are we happy to let some of that control pass over? Um, and then, obviously, how do we maintain relationships and, and, and privacy and dignity in, 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 in that kind of model? Um, I'm going to go on just, just briefly. Do I have, do I have ten, ten, ten minutes? Oh, great. Okay, yeah. Um, this is a slightly more, 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 more medical, ver medical application, which wasn't in the housing scheme, but it's in the community. Um, it's a trial that we did with a, um, a German company called Bosch, um, who have, been, um, who are, have a, a platform for chronic disease management. Now, it is, at the moment, it's specifically around um, um, heart disease, diabetes, and, 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 um, and COPD. Um, but we want to explore the applicability for this kind of model with, with, um, with, with cognitive impairment and dementia as well. So, or at least certainly at the mild stages, because it, it's, it's um, you know, I think, I think there, are, there, are, there are some interesting care connection models that might be interesting. But um, essentially, um, you know, what we're looking at, that's our home and our ranges of senses. I wanted to kind of just look specifically at this um, protocol and the, this, this, this aspect around um, um, uh, de de dealing with health data. Um, the project was done with um, 30 in a control group and 30 active participants over um, over over 90 days. Um, we had uh, we had no um, dropouts over the period. Um, I think one of the things that was particularly interesting was um, I mean these projects and whether they're small they're absolutely not randomized control trials even if we have some control in in the design they're they're very pragmatic they're trying to understand what the impacts are on quality of life and what are the impacts on service management and and service delivery um, but uh, so it was really to see how, how how a telehealth solution might 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 help patients and, and older people start to understand their disease and self and, and, and self manage their conditions and understand how clinicians might feel might 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 feel about it. Um, very briefly it's 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 based around using um, a range of um, um, health sensing devices um, um, blood pressure cuffs, uh, weighing scales, oximeters, um, respiratory devices um, we didn't use any of the the, the, the ECG um, uh, devices in this in this in this particular trial, um, and and essentially people are interacting either directly with themselves or with a carer or a family member, um, a dialogue, a daily dialogue with a little device here, and that data is sent through and is then monitored by a a, um, a, a, a health service management um, group. Um, so just for a brief, I mean, it's quite, it's quite on, that, that's, a, that's a, with, the, with the cough, and that's the, sort of the device in place. Um, the interactions are quite simple. They're, they're, they're a piece of, they're, there's a text, and you pretty much, you know, you, you, you click your button about which way to, which way to go. But the, the narrative and the model that's in behind it has been very heavily clinically trialed and clinically tested in terms of the, the, um, uh, the, 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 um, the, the learning and the dialogue that goes on. Um, and at the moment, these tend to be disease specific, and and obviously a big challenge is actually what happens if I got comorbidities and I've got a bit of everything, and you know, you know, how, how does that dialogue work in those in those kinds of contexts? And it's very very hard to get the clinicians to agree on 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 what the what the salient pieces are. Um, but essentially, what this model is about is is three things. It's a very simple kind. You can see traffic lights ideas here, but. One's, look, one's trying to get a handle on the extent to which the client has a good knowledge of the condition that they've got, is behaving appropriately in relation to that, and, 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 and therefore the symptoms are being, are being controlled. Now, I, I clearly understand that over, over a long period of time, that may be quite, this might be quite difficult for dementia, but um, I think at the early stages, and, 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 and is, um, it, it's, it's, 
so when they're having their questionnaires, they're being asked a little bit around um, how well do they understand what they're trying to deal with and, and, and that, um, and are they doing the right things, you know, are they smoking, are they drinking, what, what, all the kinds of horrible things that you have to ask yourselves and, and keep, keep track of. Um, but essentially, um, it's, it's, it's overall, it's, to try, it's based on it that if you have a better knowledge of your condition and you start to, to get your self-managing control right, that, 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 you, that you start to be able to start to manage the condition. So these are the kinds of displays that they... Um, the, 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 the triage nurse is seeing in relation to the clients and the, the, the pressurization of where, you know, where, 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 where the intensity of problems are that, that need to be start to, start to be looked at. Um, and then that's looking at a, at a particular client over, over a seven day period. Um, in some instances, things might be self reported, and other times it's, it's, it's picked up by sensors. Um, but the, for us, what was very interesting was actually to understand how does it fit into our health service, because this is a service model that doesn't exist here today. And um, we had huge problems trying to work out where does this fit into our health system, because it really does fit on the threshold between our primary care systems and our hospital systems. And that threshold isn't a very, very well navigated threshold at the moment. Um, so um, we, were, we were rescued by the enthusiasm of clinical nurse specialists. Um, who um, were working uh, in the outpatient clinics, um, who have who have responsibility for these disease for for the disease management. So one model. So that, so essentially, we brought in a new triage service. So there was remote telehealth monitoring provided by a triage nurse, geographically located, eighty miles away from us. Um, so this is pure, a really distributed telecoms model. Um, they were providing twenty four by seven. Care call on the telecare side and nine to five call back in relation to the chronic disease management data. Um, so it's not an emergency service; it's a it's a proactive health service. Um, but it worked remarkably well. I mean, you know, some 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 ad hoc information. You know, we had a, a situation where one of the participants. And their blood pressure started to go through the roof around five o'clock on a Friday afternoon, which is probably about the worst time in the week that your blood pressure could start to behave badly. Um, but it was picked up by the triage by the triage nurse. Um, a call back into the house to validate that the that the data was was valid and that it wasn't a bogus piece of data. Um, a quick call to the clinical nurse specialist who was able to come online and look at the data directly. Um, understood the situation and made a, a decision to increase the medication dose by half a tablet and within two or three hours the situation had been completely managed, dropped away. Without that type of service that would have been an emergency admission into the back end of Lourdes Hospital um, and you would have been sitting in the trolley until probably sometime Monday afternoon until something would have happened. Just just a measure of, of the, the, the flow of service that, that, that can be enabled here. Um, so that, 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 that's a very clinical nurse model. I think obviously a much more integrated model is when we start to see, you know, the tie-in with GPs and public health nurses and that. Um, I, I think, you know, for us it's probably a sense that, you know, this will evolve over time, um, but, but there's lots of changing practice and problems. And... And I'm going to argue that evidence isn't going to do this. Um, we need something more than evidence to make these practices change, and we'll we'll, we'll come to that. Um, so this is just a couple a couple a, a couple a couple of a couple of learnings. Um, our, our overall model is 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 one of of of, of it's a place based model. So we 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 we're looking at people, we're looking at environment, and we're looking at lifestyle and that and and um, uh, and, and patterns. So I'm going to just kind of run through. This is just some of our quick early learning where we are today. Um, we, we, it was a huge amount of conceptual problems. Um, the relationship between anyone and anyone else seems to be a real problem for us here in Ireland. We just, I, I think we, we're lost for language um, because we really don't know are we talking about a client, a patient, a beneficiary, a tenant, a resident, an occupant, a customer, a user, a citizen, a person. Anyone, in, we name people by the role and relationship they're in. We really don't talk about people as people. And we've got to find a, we've got to find some language that breaks this down because when we talk user, we mean somebody who's using. When we talk customer, we talk about somebody who pays. When we talk about client, we actually should be talking about somebody who pays a lot. Um, um, you know, they, 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 you know, um, you know, we 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 have a problem with this, and and it, and it, it manifests all of our relationship, and it's 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 a problem of our you know person centeredness and citizen centeredness. It's a, it's a it's a citizenship problem. It's not just person centeredness and service. I think it's a broader problem than that. 
Um, we had a huge problems around this need to categorize and differentiate. Everybody in our project wanted to know what was the disease characteristic that we were building the housing for. Was it for dementia? Was it for disability? Was it for, for end stage this? Was it for Y stage something else? We wanted a housing scheme for older people that could live and they could adapt and, and, and live in and it would follow them through their through 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 through, through, through to end of life. Um, and our, we have a real danger of our speciality becoming exclusive rather than inclusive. And I think that's going to be a real challenge for us in terms of how do we deal with our generalization as well as our specialities. And, and, and that comes that really will hit on the environment side when we start designing environments specifically for dementia, as opposed to environments for everyone that people will, because we're starting to see conflicting demands and we're going to have to start to navigate some of those things. Um, obviously, the whole problem of integrated services and assessments, the local authority has one way of doing assessments, the HSC is another way of doing assessments. In fact, the HSC has three ways of doing assessments. Um, so lots of, lots, of, lots of different worlds in here that, that were, were challenges in terms of kind of bringing some of this thing together. And then I think also just our our matching vision with with what's there today. So, for example, um, when we were looking at who might be able to move into the, the, the housing scheme, there was a sense we can't bring those people in because we don't have a night service. When actually the answer was, let's get the night service so that we can bring those people in. Um, and and that shift in in um, in, in, in in thinking is, is is something that we have to look at. At the at the implementation side, um, obviously bringing the building into place and the challenge around what's universal and what's adaptive. Um, we went for an infrastructure that was scalable um, and very general purpose and that we could start to layer things on top of it. Um, lots of, of conflicting demands around balancing sustainability versus accessibility versus anthropometrics. Um, you know, they, they, we found, it, I'll be honest, we found a difficulty that, that we couldn't get consensus between occupational therapists from four or five different groups to say this is actually what we need, you know, the, you know, so we, you know, we were finding even differences within 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 groups, and um, the whole issue around pre-configuring and how you buy this and setting things up because one exercise is to get the building so that the contractor can actually sign that he's delivered it, but all of the systems are maintained. They have to have a life. You know, we 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 like to buy concrete. We don't like buying systems that need to be maintained and supported and kept going. So there's a whole kind of challenge there. And, and then finally, this piece around, around passive ambience and, 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 and active control. Um, just my, just a couple, just to, just to finish off on. Um, one of, uh, this is a challenge for all pilot projects. So I'm not, uh, but I, it, it was just pulled together really interestingly from this guy, um, um, Erwin van, van, van Lusen over in, in Holland. And I mean, the, the picture tells it. Okay, I mean, we we love this idea of um, oops, I can come back here of, of um, you know, growing intensity of commitment. You know, so you're putting in resources along this side, and your project is running along that side. And we'd love our pilot projects to come up here and then transition into rollout phases. And just so so many of our projects fail at the transition between pilot and and implementation. It's a huge huge problem, and. I think it's it's really self-evident by the fact that so many of these projects that in this stage you're trying to evidence build and all the rest of it, you don't have the commitment of your end service provider. You're funding it through EU programs, you're funding it through national programs, you're funding it through absolutely everybody you've gone to get the money for, other than the person who should be paying for it. Okay? Because you're on the basis that you're going to build the evidence and then you're going to go and tell them it really does make sense and, and then you expect them to go and write the check for it along that stage and they'll say well we don't agree with the evidence and we don't agree and none of this has been happening it hasn't been embedded in the thinking um, so and, and that has a big challenge around how we design projects because we design projects to fail we, we design them to hit this point where we will produce the evidential report that says this makes sense and then we expect people to run it rather than looking at these as continuous change management projects where you've committed from day one to a change process that you're going to follow through um, so my big question is is, um, is is can we wait for the evidence and I think the answer is in many instances no um, and, and not to say that the evidence isn't critically important but the evidence comes after the fact the, ed the evidence follows innovation it doesn't come before it and if we're in innovation projects we have to understand that and, and, and really know where we, really know really know where we are um, and, and I really do think that that actually the key thing is that up here is you need magnets of attraction to pull people across that threshold and that's around leadership it's around um, it's around collaboration, it's around working with people, it's around creating the conditions that allow, uh, allow that 
to be transitioned. My analogy is is um I know is is, is um is it latent heat? Um, you know, you put a piece of energy in, and you know your your water goes up by one degree, and the same amount of energy pushes it up by one degree. But the amount of energy you have to put it in to move between ninety nine degrees and one hundred is an enormous amount of energy. You know that that change of that that one piece of energy to get change of state, it's change of mindset, and that's an enormous piece of energy. So there's an awful lot of work to be done to loosen the molecules around there to allow that kind of change to happen. And I think that's that that, that that's very important. Um, just um, where are where our evidence or how we how we envisaged our our our, um, our, our evidence model? Um, it's we're we're looking at a at a cost benefit analysis based on on the um, Canadian Housing and Mortgage Company, which has been doing an assessment of um, their uh, they have they have um, home adaptation schemes for both older people and people with disabilities, and it's very much around this idea of of an investment going in that's going to change your quality of life protocol, your, your quality of life um, line here. So these are generally measured in things qualies, quality of age adjusted life years, horrible economic models of quality of life and that. But but it's what the accountants listen to, so we have to kind of understand them. Um, but essentially, what one's looking at is is actually an increased quality of life and lengthening the, the threshold at which you would ordinarily have to have gone into another another state and you know so your your, your costs are in here and your your savings are are, are, are in here and uh, just to just to finish off with um, um, this is a, 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 um, a commercial announcement and um, we've been very lucky to um, be working with the World Health Organization so that, um, Dublin will be hosting the World Health Organization's age friendly cities global network in September next year. Um, it'll be a couple of weeks this year before we get these things out on websites and things, but uh, we'd love you to put it in your diary and, and, uh, and um, come along and, and join us. Thank you very much. <laughs>